Yeah, it's worse than Cuphead, man. That's it. It's full on worse than Cuphead. Way worse. Yeah. Yeah. I died like 7,000 times in Cuphead. <laughs> over to the presentation. Uh, no, I don't want to leave the Okay. And uh, yeah, we'll jump in to the, uh, the actual talk. Uh, that's, a, that's assembly? That's, it's assembly, yep. Oh, wow. 68K assembly. You, wow. You like you are <laughs> You are a freak. <laughs> So this is new language. I don't know if you've heard of it. It's called C. <laughs> uh, That's so new. Yeah, it might be a little new for me. I say that I'm the youngest one in this room. Yeah. Not as impressive as you think. Yeah. We're pretty old. It's <laughs> <laughs> not a big hurdle. You're right. You're right. Yeah. That's that's true. Yeah. And if I didn't mention, this is all stock A500. So yeah, sixty-eight thousand. OCS. OCS. Yeah. OCS. Yeah. Nice. nice. Okay, so uh, some of the stuff that we're going to go over today is general inspiration and scope. So, you are, know, you, are you on mute? Am I, no, I'm not muted. Okay, let's be picking up on my system. All right, you're okay, good. As long as everyone else can hear me, uh, I can. Um, I think just because we're close, so. our machines are closer than what Steve and I are. So. Okay. So you're good. Okay, okay. just. All right. So, um, yeah, so, so I'm. I'm a game developer by profession, so I can, you know, give you a peek into kind of my world a little bit and what goes into the game design process, how I come up with these ideas. Um, you know, beyond just the programming, there's a lot of game design considerations to make as well. So, so we're gonna we're gonna talk about that a little bit. You, you do that professionally? You, you, you're yeah. And you chose to do this as a hobby. Yeah. So, Impressive. but it, thank you. It, it creates a very interesting intersection between between the two worlds, which is why I mentioned it'll be on Steam and all that. Um, it's you know part of my job as well. So, um, okay, uh, and of course I'm going to show you my dev environment and some of the build tools that I put together in order to make this possible. Um, I'm going to show you, as part of that I you know the data files like how I put the levels together and, and, and compile them in, in a convenient way. And, 
basically how easy like modern tools make that yeah. with a really rapid iteration process that allow us to design very quickly. Um, of course, I'll go into how the game engine, work, game engine works on uh, a bit more of a, a technical level. Um, things like, you know, the way the bit, plane, the bit planes are structured and drawing the bobs and the sprites and kind of using the color palettes, various performance tricks and the physics and, and spawning in of objects and all of that. Um, and then my plans for release as well. And that'll give you a sneak peek of uh, some of the characters that we're working on. Um, okay, so a little bit about me. My name is Dan Salvato. I am a lifelong Amiga fanboy, as I mentioned, game developer by profession. Uh, I'm 31 years old, which uh, I guess kind of just caught the tail end yeah. of, uh, you know, of uh, the, the Commodore legacy, you could say. Um, and is that so how you got interested in it? Yeah, yeah. At, at my family, like, yeah, my family had an Amiga growing up, um, so which is kind of funny because I wasn't even sentient when Commodore went bankrupt. <laughs> 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 yeah, I mean, neither were they. Maybe. Yeah. <laughs> neither was Commodore. Yeah. <laughs> True. I mean, I don't know. Maybe uh, the jokes on them because when they were shitting the bed, I was the one wearing a diaper. <laughs> yeah. um, okay, so. Um, so, back around 2012, um, I started, so I, I dove into assembly for the first time by modding GameCube and Wii games. I was a big part of the competitive Super Smash Brothers community, and so I was making mods for those, so I was diving in, there was, you know, an Exxon emulator, the Dolphin emulator for GameCube and Wii that had incredible debugging tools built in, so it was pretty easy, easy for me to just um, look at this disassembly and poke around with it and mess with it, and that's how I got into it. Um, and it's, it's not all too different from 68K assembly. I mean, it was kind of the successor in spirit, so a lot of the user friendliness and, and elegance of actually working with the assembly is carried over. So it felt like a natural fit going back to 68K. Um, but anyway, as for my actual start of a career as a game developer, so in 2017, um, I released a game called Doki Doki Literature Club. It's a psychological horror game, and uh, it got very popular unexpectedly. It became the number one psychological horror game on Steam, and I think right now it's sitting at about 12 million downloads. Uh, it's a, it's a free game, so no, I'm not loaded. Just <laughs> putting that out there as well. But, um, I don't know. If you, fuck. <laughs> fuck each. If you, um, 99 uh, cents. A, qu a quick plug. Um, Eric Nelson comes to anyone sometimes. Cody Lesso, the, the Pixel Guy in the podcast. And they went through a period of time, about six months, where all they talked about, well, not all they talked about, but continuously they would come up with Doki Doki Literature Club in some reference into something that they were doing. Really? <laughs> so it was phenomenally popular for a while. Yeah, that's, that's really amazing. I, I missed that, unfortunately, but maybe I should check some of, check some of their content out. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, if you, have, if you have kids who play video games, just... Um, Feel free to text them and ask them if they've heard of Doki Doki, and if they say yes, I brought some, I brought some buttons and keychains that I'd be happy to my son. hand over to you. My son, please. My, my, yeah, my ten-year-old son. All right. Please. Um, yeah. So, so since then, um, you know, I guess I call myself a professional game developer now, even though I just like made this one anime dating sim uh, in Python. But, but I have, I have a few new projects in the works. This is the one that I'm kind of public about again because it's more more of a passion project, um, so, you know, I uh, just show off some footage and release details surrounding the development and all of that, and that's why I'm here as well. My other projects are, are secret, <laughs> still, um, but they're not Amiga games, I can say that. Um, yeah, and then my handle's on screen, and my personal website that has a blog, which uh, goes into some more detail about the game as well. You can, you can find me on, you know, that same handle on a lot of platforms, YouTube, Twitch, Twitter, Mastodon, Okay, so I want to talk a little bit about a little bit about the uh, the inspiration for this game again from from a game designer perspective. Um, the first thing is that Amiga never stopped being cool, which we all know, of course, which is why we're, we're still here. Um, it's been I, I think I can confidently say it's been a lifelong dream of mine to make an Amiga game. Um, <coughs> as I got older, the system only got cooler because I started to understand the. Incredible technical capacity.
capacity of even the original Amiga relevant, uh, relative to its time. Um, and then starting to learn about things like the bit planes and the blitter and, and the audio chip and all of that, it just continued to fascinate me. I always wanted to make something for this system. Um, but the thing is, I had to ask myself, what's something really cool that we can do with this hardware? Something that um, doesn't just try to imitate like your typical chunky graphics. Um, you know, the, the, the bit plane, the bit plane graphics and the blitter are, are so interesting. I, I feel like if I can come up with a concept that leverages those in a really unique way, uh, then I can, I don't know, really kind of push the system to its limits and, and do impressive stuff in a gameplay environment rather than do something that uh, is the same as everything else out there, but just a little bit more low fidelity. Um, so I was thinking, thinking uh, a while about that, and uh, one day I, I, th I thought bullet hell. I was watching, uh, there, there's this, this uh, sort of subgenre of bullet hell games I watch, you know. Not your shoot 'em ups, like just honest to god bullet hell, like blank at the screen with bullets. Um, <laughs> and, and it got me thinking, like, so if you, if you just blitting on one bit plane, how fast can you actually do that? Can you can you can you blit fast enough on a single bit plane to, uh, you know, to actually draw that many objects every single frame and maintain a full a full frame rate of fifty or uh, or sixty hertz? And yeah, and it turns out that you can. Uh, so I, you know, I, I ran some like initial benchmarks, and this was my first foray into Amiga assembly specifically. Um, but starting off, this was my first program. It was called Test Balls, and I just wanted to see how many of these, you know, these bouncy balls I can draw on one bit plane. And yeah, it turned out to be a substantial amount, even though I was brand new and I was probably writing some unoptimized software. Um, you know, maybe a hundred, you know, over a hundred, 150 to 200, maybe just bouncing around the screen. How much code went into the movement in each ball? I mean, you, in your game, there's a lot of geometry. It looks like with the patterns going on. Yeah. This is, seems a little more random. But how much how much CPU do you have left? To, so to, to, to still guide the balls. Um, so for this, I mean, it was pretty much it was more like how many balls can I spawn before I yeah. run out of CPU? Yeah. And and this was it. And yeah, this is very simple. It's just like each ball just has a position and a velocity. You add the velocity to the position, and that's pretty much so all you have to do. Yeah. And then you have to blit it, of course. But um, yeah, that's that's what I managed to do. And then later on, my project became known internally as Amiga Bullet. And this was a new benchmark that I did, where we have not only a more interesting pattern, you know, they have gravity now, uh, but we also have particles running in the background simultaneously, um, along with some, some nicer graphics. And by the way, this background was just like a free asset that I found online that I imported into the game. It's like a placeholder asset. Uh, we're still working on the final graphics for the game. Um, yeah, and then finally, where we are now is the title of the game, which you heard, Magic Core Anomala, uh, as it's finally known as. I was inspired by, um, you know, there's a lot of uh, uh, Japanese gaming and anime influence in this game. Um, they really like to kind of mash together English words, like nonsense English words, and you know they think it sounds really cool. So I was sort of inspired by that. You have, <laughs> I don't know, these other games like uh, like Blaze Blue Chrono Phantasma, and like just <laughs> just like, what does it mean? <laughs> yeah, it, it doesn't matter. It sounds cool, right? Um, so so that's sort of the inspiration for the title. Uh, okay. How very not white. So, <laughs> um, I, I had to think a lot about scope for this game. Yeah, I would love to. I would love to. I had to think a lot about scope for this game because um, uh, I, I have to release it eventually, of course. Um, it's already been two years and it's still kind of vaporware. So, um, but, but part of my my job or <laughs> part of my job or expertise as a game developer is is understanding the scope of a project. You know, when I plan it out initially, it's like. Is this feasible for, for me to actually do in a reasonable amount of time? And that's something really important that I think a lot of um, a lot of aspiring developers, when they ask me about you know what what I think about their ideas and things like that, it's um, it's something where it, it's really hard for them to get the scope right. Something that is achievable within your own set of skills and the amount of time and budget and energy that you have. And with those skills, are they, they did you do the music and the 
animation as well as all, all everything? Um, just about, yeah. I did the music, um, the coding, of course, and the character sprites. <coughs> I did those, but at this point, I'm starting to bring in more people to help out. So musicians and artists to help with the final assets. So it's, it's your skill sets. It's really multiple skill sets. Yeah. It isn't just you planning it, it's actually you doing it. Yeah, game development is, is unbelievably multifaceted. Um, which on the one hand, if you're doing it all on your own, it can be it can be really tough because you can be amazing, an amazing coder, but if you can't do graphics, then, then you're kind of stuck. But on the other hand, if you only have one skill, then no matter what kind of skill it is, it's probably going to be uh, applicable to game dev in some way. So if you do find people who are looking for various talents to work on a game, then you'll be able to lend your skills to that, which is really amazing. Um, so, as I mentioned, this is what I consider a modern in indie game. I want it to look, feel, and play like a modern indie game. Um, but but that, that's a pretty high bar, you know? We're still running on a 7 megahertz CPU. Okay. Um, so, that plus the amount of time it takes to code and assembly means that I have to keep the scope in check. Um, that is... So, so it's pretty challenging, like how do I put a game out on Steam with these limitations that doesn't really show and makes people today not like the game, even if they don't know it's an Amiga game. Um, that's, that's a challenge that I'm going to have to face. Um, but I think that I need the game to have high replay value, so getting the most out of limited content is really important. Um, if it's going to be, you know, let's say you get good at the game and it takes just a few hours to start, uh, play start to finish, it should be, this, this type of gameplay should be fun enough that you want to revisit and play it over and over. Maybe there's different paths you can take or different like abilities that your character can, that can equip so you can try playing the game in different ways every time and, and see what you like the most or try to challenge yourself and, and take the hard route. Um, or try to beat it as fast as possible, try speedrunning the game. Uh, that's something that I'm really into as well and, and thinking about. Um, another part of scope is to really just when coming with these concepts, you want to focus on one thing and do that one thing really well. Um, it's like, I don't think your your game your game concept needs to be propped up by this whole host of, uh, like this whole mountain of ideas in order to turn it into its complete, uh, in, into a complete game. You know, we're kind of spoiled by AAA games in that way, where there's just, uh, especially like the past five, 10 years, like these open world games that just, you can literally never run out of content. You can play for hundreds of hours and there's still more to do with these games. Um, but my philosophy is just pick like a core game mechanic or game concept and just do it very, very well. Kind of hone in on it, focus it, and make sure that's really, really fun. And then maybe over time you can slowly add additional features to the game. Um, as a part of that, uh, this game doesn't have scrolling. I don't think it needs scrolling. Um, so during these battles, there's not really much point in having a scrolling screen. And then for other methods of traversal, you can just have the system where you reach the edge of the screen and then maybe it scrolls over to the next screen. Um, that helps a lot with keeping certain parts of the game engine simple. It conserves RAM, makes the game logic simpler. Um, I also want to make sure that I'm only using the blitter for for the attacks layer, the bullets themselves, and not trying to blit these complicated graphics like as part of the background or other complicated game objects. Um, so I'm either blitting the attacks layer or everything else can just be sprites, like the characters, for example. Um, and we want to utilize hardware collision. Uh, it would be, you, you simply cannot do manual collision tests for this many objects <laughs> on the screen every single frame. That's, that's not feasible. So, so, um, so we want to, but this goes hand in hand with the design of the game. We need to design the game and the engine in such a way that we can leverage hardware collision uh, as well. So, so these were some of the considerations that I had when, um, when conceptualizing this game. Um, touching a little bit on modern game dev versus retro game dev, this, com this comes up uh, quite a bit for me as well. Um, you know, people ask like, kind of what it's like to develop games for these old systems as opposed to more modern game engines, and what's the trade-offs, and you know, why would you want to suffer doing this in the first <laughs> place? Um, and yeah, it's true. Designing for, for retro typically means that 90% of your effort is going into the engine, the stuff that people's not actually gonna see, and then 
maybe 10% of it is, is actual game design. Um, but that can be fun. You know, if you like that sort of challenge, then it, it's, you know, and that sort of problem solving can be really fun to work on. Um, and of course there are existing engines out there. I mean, Amiga has plenty of them, right? There's, there's Amos, there's Blitz Basic, um, and there's some certain newer ones as well. Um, but they also, they might be designed for certain types of games. They could be limited in their capabilities. And so if you want to do something extremely novel, uh, like I have going in this game, then, then maybe you just need to do it from scratch. Um, but you can take either approach. And typically for other retro systems as well, there are these existing engines that people are making that you can make certain types of game in, uh, games in, whether it's like simple platformers or RPGs. Um, yeah, there's, there's just many more tiny problems to solve when you're developing for a retro system like this. It's not like, it's not really high level problems anymore. It's just like the basic like, coming up with a data structure for every single thing and every little function is kind of its own problem that needs solving. Um, but there's a plus. For game development, it, it can be great to target kind of niche, passionate communities, you know? A lot of people are making are making indie games and throwing them out on Steam and kind of just hoping they catch on with their limited marketing budget. Um, but it turns out that there are communities like this one who just are all over any piece of software that's being put out. And there's a lot of enthusiasm and a lot of passion. And you, if you share that passion, then you really have the opportunity to get a lot of uh, exposure by providing something great to these niche communities. So I consider that a huge plus for, for developing games like this. Uh, okay, I'm going to spend some time showing off my dev environment. Uh, let's see, this is gonna be pretty loosely structured. Um, uh, let's see, do I need to make some, oh no, I think I can just alt tab out, there we go. Um, I am using Vim, or NeoVim, to develop this game. Uh, does this look easy? Yeah, yeah, let me zoom in a little bit. Uh, is, that, is, that, is that all right? Yeah. Okay. And, okay. Um, so, if I'm going to be honest, VS Code is probably the way to go. Uh, I just, you know, I, Vim is, it's, it's fun for me to use, and amazingly, there are a couple plugins that for, for Amiga assembly development that are available on Vim as well. Um, but I have uh, I have VS Code up here as well, and again, I can probably just well, it's not that big, okay. And uh, VS Code, there's there's an amazing extension for VS Code that's just called Amiga Assembly. You you grab the extension, it basically sets up the whole build environment for you. Um, it grabs the binaries that you need, like the assembler binaries. It grabs uh, the emulator, not just the emulator, but a special fork of the emulator that includes the debug adapter protocol, so you can do your debugging right in VS Code, which is incredible. Um, Breakpoints and step through your code and watch memory and stuff like that. Uh, they made it unbelievably uh, accessible. So, yeah, I was on VS Code for a while, and it, it honestly works great. Um, I just switched over to Vim just for fun because it's uh, my own personal preference. Um, but, but this is pretty much how I do things. I mean, I have a just a hotkey that runs a quick build script if I want to um, if I want to run a build. Let me see. I think I can uh, just do that right now. Yeah, it pops up in less than a second. So the iteration is just incredibly fast. I can make a change in code and it builds in just less than a second. Here was here was an attack I was working on. It looks kind of like a bird flapping its wings. Um, and then, if I want to, uh, no. I, I just have kind of like a temporary function here that's, you know, that loads in the game scene and the attack that I want it to load. So I can, you know, change the attack number, jump back in, and test out this other attack. Um, yeah, the iteration process is just really, really fast. Um, here's another one I was working on. This is, uh, I'm going to have a level that takes place kind of like in a library. So the boss here is going to have sort of these, like, brushstroke and Japanese character themes. So that's one that I was working on. And then, let's see. Uh, so let's not use the attack. Let's take out the enemy, and then let's instead um, build some of the rooms. This is a more recent feature as well. I started working on uh, having kind of a set of rooms that's like an obstacle course that you traverse before you reach the boss. And right now, of course, it's very ugly. It's just 
placeholder graphics. It actually, it looks kind of like a ZX Spectrum game. <laughs> uh, with the, kind of the, the one-bit graphics there. Um, but, uh, but it'll look a lot nicer once we actually have graphics done. So yeah, I can test these out. And I'll show you in a second how I build these rooms uh, and get them into the game. But yeah, we can go over here and then I should to the next room. Again, no scrolling, keeping the scope in check. Oh, so that's just, yeah, that's a graph, that's just a visual effect for when you do an aerial jump. Okay, so it's not helping with you to do any kind of positioning or, or testing or anything? Uh, no, that's, that's uh, an actual visual effect for the game. And then you'll notice when I use my third aerial jump, one, one, two, three, it blinks to tell you that it's your last jump. Well, maybe it doesn't really show up on Zoom because the frame rate isn't high enough, but, but whatever. Yeah, so this is um, yeah, so this is it's pretty much my environment, and some of the convenience features are um, you can highlight any assembly instruction and look at the documentation for it, just right in here. Oh, and VS Code can do all of this too, by the way. Um, so this this can be incredibly useful if you need to see, for example, which condition flags uh, are being set by the instruction, um, and then it is the same for. Let me see if I can. An example. That's um, a That's a Vim extension. So this is yeah, there's an Amiga assembly extension for Vim that provides this feature. Um, or it's a uh, it's an Amiga assembly language server, and NeoVim has uh, supports the language server protocol, which is the same as VS Code on how you get a language support uh, built in. And so it's kind of like an API where you can you know there is a for example, kind of a documentation API that they can uh, that they can interface with in order to provide. So you're getting the exact same help text, of whether or not you're in Vim or Visual Studio. Correct. So I can do the same thing mouse over here, and it looks a little bit nicer because oh, they have marked down. Yeah, but um, yeah, it's it, it's the exact same. And then it looks nicer, but it's not. It's, it's compact. It's, not that that. It's, it's compacting. It's like with the. Uh, right on that one screen. That's true, that's true. Although to be fair, I have not really done much customization with VS Code uh, on the visual side. I mean, it has a ton of customization if you really look into it. It's just what they give you on the tin is not what you have to stick with. Um, but I never really looked into it. Um, and then, aside from just uh, instructions, comments that you write. Um, so this is one that I wrote, for instance, for this macro. Um, uh, it provides those as well, which is, again, this is stuff that you typically expect for an IDE, but you're used to having it in like higher level languages like C, but you know, the fact that they put effort into providing this for Amiga assembly is amazing. And I think I can, yeah, and I can just jump to the definition of the macro like that, um, and here's my comments. It's incredibly streamlined and useful. Um, it's these modern tools. If it weren't for these tools, I don't think I ever would have gotten into this, because it's just, the whole dev process is so streamlined um, you have rapid iteration, it's, it's you know, they, they've done away with so much of the stuff that like, when you're just getting started, you would just bash your head over, spending hours trying to set this stuff up. Um, and that's been, that's been really amazing. So, um, let's see, getting into the build tools a little bit. So I was showing you some of those rooms earlier that I was traversing through. Um, and I mentioned I was gonna talk about how I could get these into the game. And again, I'm pretty much using all modern tools for this. You have to figure out, like, um, you know, I'm creating the graphics, creating the room layout, and I need some kind of pipeline to pack them into some sort of binary format and, and then give them to my game, and then my game understand, understands the data structures and then goes and draws them to the screen. Uh, it's a very multi-step process, but again, modern tools uh, just make this process so streamlined. So much, in fact, that I'm going to jump into Photoshop here. I just have an image of the room, and I can, I mean, I can just draw and like make modifications. So I, I can, um, like, let me see, I'll just, you know, put this up here, and I don't know, maybe this part's too hard, so I'll get rid of it. Oh, not like that. I need, I need to draw black over it. Yeah, get rid of that obstacle. 
And then I'm just going to save this file, jump back over here, build again, and that's it. That's, that's my room modification. So now when I go in, you'll see the, the, the modified room. Um, it's, it's unbelievably fast Ooh. to perform this iteration. It's, it, it's incredible uh, what modern tools provide us uh, in being able to do this. And as part of this, I created uh, an open source piece of software written in Python. It's called Simple Binary Builder. Uh, you can find it on GitHub. But what it allows you to do, and this is not Amiga specific, this is for, this is general purpose. So anytime you want to create just custom data structures and pack them into a binary format, uh, it's an extremely simple way of doing it. So I'll, I'll show you an example. Um, let me bring up uh, this file. So it, so it uses toml files where you can just, you provide, uh, you just provide integers and strings for whatever pieces of data that you want, and then you can, in Python code, and even if you don't really know Python, I made it simple enough that you should just be able to do this. Um, so I created a data structure that I called group, and then using type annotations, um, every single, uh, every single, uh, component of this data structure, I just, I name it and then specify the type, so there's booleans and U16, a couple of arrays, um, and write in my code, uh, my, it, it's like a self-documenting piece of code that shows me the data structure for this object, so this is the room that we were looking at. Um, you know, see there's like a starting position, there's something that specifies the exits, and then uh, the hazards image um, that I was messing with in Photoshop just a moment ago. Um, so yeah, using, using my tool Simple Binary Builder, you can just very quickly put together these data structures, feed it a toml file, um, which, let me see, there should be spreadsheets. Oh, this is common, I have to Forgive open up. Forgive me, what is a toml file? A toml, it's, it, it's just a type of markup language. So you have like, um, you know, you have like YAML, for instance. Right. Um, so it's, so toml, it's designed to be a very human-readable markup language. Um, so instead of JSON, or in some cases YAML, I mean YAML is very nice too, but it's designed to be very flat. So instead of having like nesting and nesting and all these brackets and, um, and things that are good for computers to parse, uh, this is designed to be very human readable and human modifiable. Um, and for that reason I chose it, but also because it is, uh, Python has a library built in to parse toml, and so I didn't need to uh, bring in an external, external source. So let's see. Yeah, so down here, here are some rooms that I'm specifying. Again, I just have what you saw in the uh, data structure. It has hazards, has tiles, uh, starting position, the exits, and all of that. Um, then back here, it so matches. So Photoshop, you say the hazards of the PNG? Yeah, so as part of this pipeline, as part of my Python script, it takes the PNG image, uh, which is, it's not an RGB PNG, it's an index PNG. And so I just have something in Python, which is really, really good at parsing images, to just kind of, to just look at the pixels, and in order to figure out where the platforms are, uh, it looks at certain pixels and sees if they're like color index one, for example, which means that it's a platform. And then it looks for pixels that are color index two, which might be the hazards layer. And then in Python, um, I am calling a subprocess to um, to another program that converts PNGs into Amiga bitplane format, um, and that's another reason Python is so incredibly convenient for this because you just it, it's it's such it's it's such an easy toolkit to use. It has you know it has like everything in, in the kitchen sink or whatever everything about the kitchen sink. I don't know what the actual phrase is because there was the kitchen sink for the Amiga video toaster. <laughs> And they kind of have the marketing, like, okay, whatever. Um. <laughs> <laughs> it's been a while. They yeah, might forgive you. Yeah. But, yeah. They might forgive you. Um, yeah, but, but, but Python is so convenient for that reason. It's like, it has a library just for everything. So for image processing um, and for calling some processes, it's extremely easy. So, so yeah, things like images and sound effects, I could just bring in as PNGs and use the right tools to convert them into a format that Amiga understands. Yeah, so that's that's a little bit of a peek into my build process. And I even have a scripting system for writing dialogue. <coughs> um, let me see. So
So this is, and this is some dialogue that you haven't seen yet, it wasn't in the demo, this is for the uh, library scenario that I was writing. Um, and by the way, it has syntax highlighting because it is really, really easy to add custom syntax highlighting in Vim. It took me like maybe less than an hour, so that's, that's very pleasant as well. Um, yeah, and then... Now you can only write dialogue. Because <laughs> that's another one of those specialties. Yeah, yeah, writing as well, you're right. <laughs> that, that's true. Um, yeah, so I just have... Um, um, what was the file called? Dialog.py, that sounds correct. Um, yeah, so this is just a big Python file, again, that takes this script format and looks at the opcodes like label, clear, char, and the numbers to choose like the portrait, jump, things like that, and converts them into um, different byte opcodes. And using, again, a simple binary builder, it packs them into a binary, I send them over to Amiga, and then on this side I have um, the same thing, all the opcodes for all the different uh, for all of the different dialog commands. So very easy interop between both systems, and it's just it's incredibly pleasant to use something as flexible as Python to, to do all of this heavy lifting um, and keep it in sync with, with the uh, data structures on the Amiga side. Um, so let me make sure I want I want to keep an eye on the chat as well in case you know people have questions or comments, but. But yeah, I mean, as for like this, this environment of build tools, if anyone has questions or like wants to look at anything in particular, then I'd be happy to show it off. So when you, so when you go to, to create a build, you've got, you're running all these Python scripts as part of that build Correct. process. Yeah. So this isn't necessarily the, the, just the out of the box build you would get from small extension. You had to, you had to, insert your step, your build steps into the out of the box build process. Sure, but it was incredibly easy. I mean, I just have this shell script that all it does is run the Python scripts and then run VA, the VASM builder and, and that's it. <laughs> like, there, there wasn't really much intermediary work at all. It was just a very simple shell script to first run the Python scripts and then run VASM. Uh, so that was really straightforward as well. And I have almost no experience. Again, I don't have experience with C, amazingly. I'm doing assembly, but never really touched C. And so one of, one of the great skills you get in, in knowing C is, is the build system, because it is not, not really easy. <laughs> you know, make files and linkers and all of that. Uh, I'm pretty new to all of that. But uh, again, this was simple enough that I was able to make it work without much friction. So the, the Python you do like the scripting, um, is that putting out assembly code if it gets compiled or is that putting out a data set, set that gets read in by your program? Yeah, the Python puts out data. Okay, so it's just yeah. the data set. So, yeah, so again, like <laughs> data structures like this where you just have, and then on the, uh, on the assembly side, uh, exact same data structure. So bytes for has bytes, has tiles, event ID, etc. And they're perfectly in sync. And uh, and if I wanted, I could like, you know, just on the fly, if I want to change this data structure, which you're doing a lot when you're, you know, iteratively developing these games, you're like, oh, I actually need this piece of data in there. It's like you can come up with a small new feature on the fly, you realize you're missing something. I can like add, I don't know, magic number after event ID and then create a definition to set the magic number. And then, um, and then I can either pull this from the toml file that I was showing you before, and okay. it, it's smart enough to pick it up automatically. It sees that it's called magic number, and it'll bring it in. Or I can write a function in Python to like set it myself, so I can just do that, for example. Um, and then, um, why is it giving me an error here? Oh, look at that, because I already wrote it before when I was testing for the first time. <laughs> <laughs> How cute. Yeah. That, I seem less smart now because this was all planned. 
you can just you walk right into my planned presentation. So anyway, um, yeah, so I inserted magic number here, and now let's go back over to, to here. Let's see, it was after event ID, right? So if I do this, and we, uh, well actually, let's see what happens if I don't include this. We expect it to crash, obviously, because now there's a, uh, a misalignment between the, the data structure of the binary and then the one that my program is expecting. So let's run this and see what happens. Um, just for fun. Oh, goodness. Okay, so now I'm all the way over here, and the tiles are messed up. Okay, yeah, but that's, that's expected. So, so let's put this in here and see if that fixes things. Yeah, there we go. Okay. And this, yeah, this is something I was stressing over for so long, was how to, like, you know, working with these sorts of data structures and how to kind of build my level files and, and take data from outside the game, you know, the game design stuff and actually put it in the game. And that's why I came up with this system to uh, make it very seamless and have it be part of this rapid iterative process, kind of like everything else is developing this game. Um, and that's part of Again, the 90% engine, 10% game design, well, a lot of the engine stuff is done, so now when I go to design the game, I can actually make a good game because I can test ideas very rapidly uh, like that. So, okay, let's, um, let's head back to the presentation now, and, and also, how are, we, how are we doing on time? Don't worry about it. All right. Oh yeah, it's the last presentation, so I got to keep <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> It's not like I flew out here or anything, just for you. <laughs> Where did you fly from? <laughs> I'm from Boise. Really not that far. <laughs> so, yeah, don't worry about it. There's a need in Idaho? Um, there, in one house, there is. <laughs> but at this point, I probably have enough for the whole state. I have like two closets full of them, so. Um, okay. While you're here, pick up some more. <laughs> oh, I would love to. As long as I can get it on the plane, I don't know about that. How they would feel about maybe lugging like a couple of CRTs under my arms with me on the plane. Oh. Uh, like a stereo on the B. Yeah. <laughs> I took 10 uh, three and a half inch fluffy disk drives last year back home. TSA was really Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, I stuck the eight of my hundred into my carry-on bag, and it went yeah. right through. <laughs> so yeah. that was pretty impressive. The last the last uh, couple of years have much better at computers being on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, five <laughs> years ago, they make you take it out and sniffing it. Like, what, what is this strange box you got <laughs> in your it's yeah. computer? Or you got it. Okay, let's talk about bit planes. Um, something that might elude the knowledge base of people doing Amiga OS 4. Well then again, I don't know anything about PowerPC Amigas. For all I know, maybe they are using bit planes for some godforsaken reason, but I hope not. Uh, it's all chunky. Okay. Or right. RGB. Yeah. Well, well, we all came from 68K. Yeah, so okay. So I mean, most is everyone like mostly comfortable with bit planes? You can raise your hand if you're just like, you never fully understood what bit planes, how, you know. No, Okay. Easy. Okay. Yeah. I'm, like I have sort of half an explanation. I didn't want to, you know, start from zero. But I'll talk a little bit about how the game is structured anyway. So the background is three-bit planes. So it's eight-color backgrounds. Um, of course, you can, as you know, you can use the copper to just change the palette at any horizontal line. So if I really wanted, um, I could. If I wanted to get more eight colors, like you have maybe the sky area on the horizon and then the ground, I could sort of get more than eight colors out of the background. But for the time being, the backgrounds are just eight colors. Um, so three bit planes for that. Uh, and then the attack layer is on bit plane number four. So this gets laid over on top, and with my handy graphic of the red ones, you can see that once, once you add the attack layer, wherever a pixel is turned on in the attack layer, you go from color zero to seven to colors eight to 15. So, this is the fourth bit plane, and there are technically eight colors assigned to the attack layer, but you don't actually get to use all eight of those colors because they're dependent on the background underneath of it as well. So... Unless you want to hide a pixel or something. Yeah, yeah. Um, but, I mean, in, in the context of my game engine, the background is static, and I'm only glitting to the, to the attack layer. 
so, um, so I'm not trying to do anything crazy and fancy. Um, but yeah, I try to do something like this, where since the, uh, you know, the pixel of the attack layer is dependent on the background behind it, I try to take the background color palette and sort of, um, sort of transform those colors, shift them up, um, or shift the hue a little bit in order to create this interesting kind of additive blending effect. So um, sort of got a transparency to it. Yeah, yeah, and I think that looks very cool. And there's there's all kinds of, you know, just by changing the color palette on the fly as you play, you can do all kinds of interesting and cool color effects. Um, which so far in the demo, I haven't messed with all that much, but kind of the the infrastructure is there in order to mess with the colors, which we're going to talk about right now. Look at that. I planned very well. I was going to the last thing, a uh, real breakthrough was that you could use colors to, to animate. Yes. Uh, yeah, yeah, the, uh, the palette switching to create pseudo animations. Yeah. That, was, that was popular in video games even, kind of just like like waterfalls kind of falling. They just Good switch cycle colors. colors. Yeah. Right. Oh, and even the boing ball did that, actually. Yeah. It was just slices of different colors, and they shifted the palette. Um, okay, so uh, as I mentioned, background is color 0 to 7, attack layer is colors 8 to 15, but we don't really get to use all eight of those colors. Um, color 16 is transparency for the sprites. Um, color 17 to 22 are for the player sprite. So the player sprite and, and the enemy sprite are combined sprites. You squish two sprites together and you get 16 color sprites. Um, Color 23 is that light, that cyan color that I had for the attacks that you're shooting and the, and the jump graphic as well. Okay. Um, and then finally, 24 to 31 is for the enemy sprite, and that's that's how I have the, the colors divvied up. Um, let's see. I'm storing colors as 8-bit RGB. Um, so 8 bits for each color, instead of, you know, Amiga has 4-bit color palettes, I'm doing 8 bits internally. Um, and for good reasons, not for higher color fidelity. That obviously doesn't make sense because they have to be squished down to four bit anyway uh, once they're in the copper list. Um, but it turns out if you want to do color effects, so you do additive color blending, um, um, other like, you know, you want to make the character flash red or something like that and have like a smooth transition. Even other interesting stuff like desaturating the colors, like. Um, you know, like when I did damage to the opponent in the background, turned black and white while the bullets were exploding. Um, that's a lot easier to do if you have 8-bit or, or byte-aligned uh, values because, you know, you don't have to do bit shifting for like the green is like, or, or what is it, the red is kind of in the lower bits and the green is in the higher bits and having to isolate those with logical operations and doing bit shifting. Um, you can avoid that just by internally using 8-bit color values. And it turns out that in a single blit with the blitter, you can convert 8-bit to 4-bit colors for, uh, so you kind of have the best of both worlds, extremely efficient conversion and uh, efficient color operations. And uh, I have a small breakdown of how I do this. Um, I have a blog post that goes into a little more detail, but basically um, you split it up into two blitter registers. So one is red and blue and the other is, is green. Then you use the A masking register of computer <coughs> to get rid of the low bits, and then and then you use C, put a static data 0, 0, 0 in C, and uh, intersect that with the green to get rid of the low bits on green, and then you union the two together, and that's what you get. Again, for the full code, I, I, have, a, I have a blog post about this that goes in a little bit more detail, so. You know, if you're not versed on blitter operations, then don't worry too much about it right now. Um, just trust me that it's easy. Oh, and this whole thing for each color, it's only eight cycles because the blitter is that amazing. Um, a single blit operation for all 32 colors, eight cycles each, and that's it. Uh, just once per frame. I also have a routine for fast HSV to RGB conversion. So I can even set up colors as hue, saturation, and value. Um, and then run them through a function that converts them to RGB very quickly. I found, man, I, I don't remember if I have the, the link anymore, but I found this really efficient C function for HSV to RGB, and I just I converted it to assembly. And um, this from the demo earlier, this is where I used it just as part of the demo, where you have this rainbow effect, where it kind of cycles through the, the colors. 
Um, that was just an example of how I used it in the demo, but that was uh, HSV to RGB, and I think there's a lot more interesting stuff you can do with that than just cycle through the rainbow colors, and that's how I showed it off in the demo. Um, okay, so we can go a little bit over music next. We talked about some technical stuff, so I just wanted to breathe a little bit to talk about the music design process. Um, so this is not technical. Um, and and I'm not the most amazing musician in the Amiga community. I mean, the freaking demo scene is just, like, the, the songs that they produce are just absolutely unbelievable. Um, DJ Hoffman, of course, and um, all the others who are <coughs> slightly less publicly visible than DJ Hoffman, so I don't know their names, but, um, yeah. but they're doing incredible stuff. But yeah, I kind of had to learn the skill as well. I have some, you know, I've dabbled in like music production, so I'm just gonna show you a little bit of my process of how I kind of come up with this and then convert it into an Amiga track. Um, let me see, and I'm gonna play some audio, so let me mute myself while I do that. This is, so I kind of start out with, I come up with sort of a melody in my head that I just put on piano first, um, just to get it down, you know, and that's like my initial sketch, and so that's, that's what I'm gonna play first here. One sec. Unmute? Okay. Okay, so that was my initial concept that I just got down on piano. Um, it sounds kind of you know, it's a little bit classical, um, sounds kind of fancy, like you can maybe hear this being played on a harpsichord, for example. Um, but I need to turn this into a boss song, <laughs> you know, with intense action, and so, so I need to change up the angle a little bit, make it a little bit scarier sounding, you know? Again, this, this is for the uh, library level I was talking about, so you're kind of in this library, and, um, and the boss character is someone who uses a magical pen to kind of steal your soul and convert it into a biography. And so, and so she's kind of a scary character in that sense. It's like this scary, uh, uh, oppressive vibe. So the next step was to um, create something more comprehensive in my music software. I just use FL Studio. Um, and when I compose this, I'm thinking about the limited sound channels on Amiga as well. However, I don't, I don't try to go one-to-one, -one, like, okay, I only get this many sound channels. I actually try to stretch it a little bit. I don't really mind using chords. Uh, I, don't mean pack, I, I don't mind packing on a few extra samples, because what you can do is um, you can, if there's like one part of the song, maybe just like half a second, where there's like many sounds playing at once, you can render that all as a single sample and play it only on one audio channel. So I deliberately kind of only loosely follow the restrictions of the Paula sound chip when I compose it in, um, in FL Studio, so this is a uh, so I'll play. This is a this is a one minute clip. I'll just play it out, and then I'll, and then we'll switch over to Protractor to get to hear the Protractor version of it. Well, I think that um, 
first of all, electronic samples are just very cool sounding. But they also work really great on Amiga because the waveforms are so simple and render the sample as just a few, you know, a few bytes of data. And that's all you need to create a really nice sounding uh, electronic synth. Um, but the other thing is, I think like going with this kind of similar theme through the, through the soundtrack helps to set set apart the atmosphere of this game a little bit compared to um, I don't know the games of yesteryear. Uh, where you don't have this sort of this sort of soundscape, and, and that's kind of important to me as well. Where there's a lot of people making retro style games, um, where they use the exact instruments of the retro system, or they try to emulate a style that you would hear on the retro system, um, which I totally respect and I love that as well as someone who, of course, loves these retro systems and the games on them. But I think. Uh, it's an equally viable approach to try to give yourself a unique identity in this space. And I think it goes along really well with this theme of, again, I'm making an Amiga game, but I'm trying to make it look and feel like a modern indie game. So I, I think in that sense, it, it, it works quite well. Um, OK, and finally, the ProTracker version. And you'll notice that I'm only using three audio channels, because the fourth one has to be reserved for sound effects. So I mean, I'm even uh, more restricted in that sense. Uh, but I'll go ahead and play this, and maybe you'll be surprised by how similar it sounds. Stack. 
This stack contains 200 pointers, one for every single bullet in the array. And when I first initialize it, it's just in order. So again, the, the first pointer is bullet zero, the next one's bullet one, the next one's bullet two, etc. Because all the bullets are free, we haven't spawned any yet. And now finally at the top, I have a pointer to the current entry in the stack we need to concern ourselves with. Again, no bullets have spawned in, so just the first bullet in the free stack <coughs> is the one we're concerned with. So let's spawn a bullet. Uh, this is all we have to do. We look at the next bullet that's free, which it tells us right here is bullet number zero. Um, and then we spawn, we spawn the bullet in, in the array in position of bullet number zero. And then in this stack, we just move it down. Uh, so, and I'm zeroing out that top entry of the stack just to make it visually a little bit more clear. You don't actually have to do that. Um, yeah, so now bullet zero is no longer free. We spawn an object there, so it's no longer in the, the stack of three bullets, obviously. And we update this pointer up here to point to the next, uh, to the next entry in the stack. Um, so let's spawn another bullet. It's the same thing. You just, you know, grab the current, like the, the, the current free bullet. Uh, spawn an object to it and then move down to the next item in the stack. We'll spawn another one. Um, but now let's say the very first bullet we spawn, bullet number zero, let's say it leaves the screen and we need to despawn it. Uh, all we have to do is the reverse. We move up the stack, put bullet number zero back onto the stack uh, as the current as the current free bullet and then, and then decrement this number so we're, we're kind of just moving up the stack like that. Um, and the order really doesn't matter. Like that could be bullet zero, and then maybe uh, the next bullet that lives in the screen is like bullet number two, and then bullet number one. And now, next time you need to spawn a bullet again, this is just the list of free bullets, so we can move that way, and we spawn these bullets, and then we free them in, in any arbitrary order. And this is how uh, you know I I uh, created a simple data structure to solve this problem of like. Not having to traverse the array and like find a free entry in the array every time I wanted to spawn a bullet, um, this this makes it just extremely fast and simple to arbitrarily spawn and despawn them in any order. Maybe for people who are coding in C with data structures all the time, this is an obvious solution. But uh, you know, again, I, I, I had this this challenge very early on in development before I was too used to working with these data structures, and so uh, you know, I was I was pretty happy with the solution when I came up with it. Um, and speaking of despawning, there's bounce checking. Uh, we got to figure out when a bullet leaves the screen. And that is pretty easy. Uh, here's a C function that does it. All you have to do, so you have an upper round, say it's, you know, 320 because that's the horizontal width of the screen. Um, so all you have to do is, if you want to check if it's in bounds, is the position greater than zero, or greater than or equal to zero, and is it less than the upper bound, or 320, or whatever it is. That's great, but we can do this in one comparison instead of two. We don't have to check both zero and upper bound. We only have to check upper bound if it's an unsigned integer, because if, if the position goes less than zero, if it's negative one, well, as an unsigned integer, that's something like four billion. It wraps around, so if we treat it as an unsigned integer, which it's just you use the correct branch instruction in assembly instead of it caring about sign instead of caring about the uh, condition flag for for whether or not it's uh, signed effectively. Uh, you just swap out the, the instruction for unsigned comparison, and then you get to do it in one comparison instead of two. And again, over the course of 200 bullets, when you want to optimize this loop, uh, it makes an incredible difference. Uh, just simple optimizations like this. Um, and that carries into the physics as well. So now we're actually going to get a, a bit of a chunkier piece of assembly code, but don't worry, we'll, we will walk through it. This is a very basic physics routine. First, you grab the x position, put it into register 0. Grab the y position, put it into register 1. And then you add the x velocity to register 0. You add the x velocity to register 1. Um, and then presumably later down, you take those registers and you, you write them back to the data structure. And then there's the, uh, the bounce checking as well. You have the, uh, the new x position and the new y position of these registers, and you're just comparing them with the, uh, the bounds and destroying them if, uh, if they are out of bounds. 
But there's a pretty interesting optimization we can do in this physics routine, which is a little bit of a cheat, and it's not perfect, but it is perfect enough for my use case. And this is what it is. We use 32-bit uh, uh, addressing instead of 16, or 32-bit instructions, I should say. So the x and y position are 16-bit values that are right next to each other in memory. So we can use a single instruction to just move a 32-bit long word into a single register. And then we can do the same for velocity, where we add 32 bits, um, x and y velocity, to this register that has x and y positions. And that actually saves uh, a good number of cycles to do that. And we can go ahead and break it down here. I just provided this little look at the register, so it's a little bit easier to understand what's going on. So the first instruction, we just grab the x and y position, we put them into register zero. So the upper 16 bits are going to be the x position, and the lower 16 bits are going to be the y position. Then we grab the velocity, x and y velocity, again, 32 bits in, in a single instruction, and we add it to the 32-bit position. <coughs> upper 16 bits get added for x, lower 16 for y. The side effect here is that if y is negative, then you're going to have you know, f, f, something, something, but you're doing addition, and then there's going to be a uh, carry. So the, the upper bit of y, if it's negative, gets carried into the lowest bit of x if you perform this optimization, because it's a, it, it's a, you're adding a 32-bit number, not two separate 16-bit numbers. Um, but if you have fractional pixels that are small enough, subpixels, then this is not really consequential, and this is a simplified view in my actual game. I have small fractional pixels for each of the bullets, and so if there's that tiny inaccuracy and getting carried over into the exposition, then it's actually not that big of a deal. Um, okay, and then finally, um, we have x in the upper and y in the lower 16 bits. So for the balance checking, um, when we're checking the x bounds, we actually have to put the upper bound in the upper 16 bits and then compare long word between these two. And then for, for y position, it's, it's just the lower bits, so we can do the normal uh, lower 16 bits comparison. And all of these optimizations added up between the bounce checking and the physics routine, I think saves about 20 cycles, uh, which multiplied by 200 is, what, 4,000 cycles every frame? That is very, very substantial for what we're doing. So. Um, yeah, not trying to over-optimize at this point. I already made that mistake. Um, and then it turns out if you want to make one tiny change to the way your engine works, you have to like rip everything apart. But these optimizations are, are pretty fundamental and I think a large part of how this game works in the first place. Um, okay, one, one more thing I want to talk about regarding the game design is what I call spirographs. So you probably noticed during the demo, I mean there were some cool attacks, like there's the spear attack at the end and there was um, the Adobe Acrobat something. Thank you. I was about, that's what I call it too, the Adobe Acrobat. <laughs> um, yeah, so I wanted to talk a little bit about how I'm drawing those, and again, like how it's, how it's being done quickly, you know, that's kind of like, it looks kind of like a demo scene effect. It's really exciting to be able to put that in actual gameplay, you know what I mean? Um, and I have an amazing system for creating those effects, and I'm going to uh, explain it using these video clips I took from another game on Steam called I Want a Maker, where you have a spinning stick, and you have a bullet at the end. In this case, it's that, that piece of fruit, uh, whether it's an apple or a cherry. No one will never know. But um, so you have this spinning stick, and basically all you can do is oh, let me um, let me get out of this. Okay, I'm gonna quit this video. This is pretty much all it's doing. And of course, it's drawing all of those in a single frame. You know, it's, it's stepping 10 times around and, and drawing every single one of these bullets in a single frame. But that's pretty much it. It's a sine and cosine of a certain angle. And then depending on the length of the stick, um, depending on the length of the stick, I am uh, multiplying the sine and cosine by a certain value. So I am using multiplies here. I don't think there's really any way around it in this case. Um, if you want arbitrary lengths of, of, of this stick here. Um, but that's pretty much how I'm doing it. 
But this only makes circles, of course, because it's just sine and cosine all the way around. So how do you make more complex shapes? You stick two sticks onto each other. So you do a sine and cosine of one angle, and then you add. And then you do a sine and cosine of another angle, and you add that on top of it, and you can do different stick lengths for each of them. And now watch when I play this. Look at the interesting patterns that it's making now, just by sticking two of these on top of each other. So it's all just sine and cosine. And now if I show you the, uh, the spawner, this is what it looks like. Or we're all the it's Adobe Acrobat. <laughs> uh. So yeah, and just by playing with um, the length of each stick and the speed at which each of them are spinning relative to each other, positive or negative, and uh, simple simple values like that, you can make just all kinds of crazy and interesting uh, effects. Like here's another simple one where the second stick this time is shorter and spins a little bit faster. Um, it creates sort of like this four-petal flower kind of thing going on. Um, and I was messing around with this a lot. I even have a little tool in my game engine to uh, mess with the properties to see what interesting shapes I can make. Um, so I found a couple just video recordings from early in development of me messing around with this. Here's like a weird thing that I did. Um, and, and and the bullets the bullets are not actually moving back and forth. Every single frame I'm drawing a new set of bullets, then I'm wiping it slightly changing the parameters, like the speed of the sticks, and then drawing a new set of bullets. Um, and it's just because of slightly tweaking the parameters each frame that it looks like it's animated, but it's actually drawing a brand new set every single frame. The bullets aren't actually moving. Um, and then, let me see. I mean, here's another interesting one when I was um, uh, messing around with like how to make kind of 3D looking stuff. Before I had the sphere totally worked out, I was uh, using this spirograph technique to create kind of these ellipses that kind of change uh, their, you know, they sort of stretch and squish. And I saw that and I was like, this, this could work really well for like a pseudo 3D effect. Um, and that's how I did the sphere. It's entirely just sine and cosine. It's just ellipses stacked using sine and cosine uh, to create the different angles. Um, so this ended up becoming a very, a very key part of, of the game engine, and I plan on using a lot more of those effects in the future. Um, okay, so how are we on time? We're good. We're still doing okay? Let me double check here to see how much I have. We've got about 15 minutes. Okay. okay. What? We're sort of, uh... 15 minutes for what? For dinner. Oh yeah, well, we're, it's fine. We're getting to the end of it anyway. I think we're done with most of the technical stuff, so uh, so we can we can take a little bit of a breather there. Um, I mentioned hardware collisions. Uh, it turns out that Amiga has just incredible hardware collision support. You can um, you know check collisions between different sprites, or I think different groups of sprites technically, between sprites and bit planes, which is how I'm doing it in the demo. I just have the character sprite and literally for free, it tells me if the sprite has collided with the bit plane that the attacks are on. And that's pretty much it. I'm done with collisions. It's absolutely free. And that's actually really amazing. It's pixel perfect collision. Um, but it doesn't really end there because there's no lenience, right? So my character, so for example, my character has hair that's kind of whipping around as she's jumping and, and attacking and stuff. and. Um, and it feels kind of unfair, maybe, if like the back pixel of her hair, because you're running and it's flying behind her, like touches a bullet, and then you, you take a hit because of that. Um, lenience feels really, really good in video games. Uh, you want to create those close calls for the player. Um, you know, think about like, even like Pac-Man, for example. It's like you get the you like round the corner and the ghost kind of touches you, and you're like, eh, and you just yeah. get past it, and just like you know, it feels really awesome when you have those moments and you really remember those. So we want to create those and introduce some kind of lenience into the collision system. But um, how are we going to do that with Amiga's hardware collision that just checks if a pixel is overlapping another pixel? Um, as I mentioned, the hair should have no collision, so. We could start to think about this. There's one solution where you just have the hair on a separate sprite. Um, hmm. And then maybe depending on the way the sprites are grouped together, you can you know, only check a collision for, for the sprite that doesn't have the hair. But I think this is an imperfect solution 
uh, for a couple reasons. One, it's uh, it it makes the colors a little bit complicated, maybe because now you have an attached sprite for the character, and you have to make sure the sprite with the hair is like aligned with the correct color palette, which I already have divided in like a very specific way. But aside from that, um, I want more lenience than this. The character has a black outline around the whole sprite, which is by design, and it's kind of the same thing where I don't really want that to widen the whole character's hitbox just to have that outline there. Um, so I came up with another interesting solution, which is to use the blitter. The blitter has a flag called, I think it's BLT0, which is every time you perform a blit, if it actually blits pixels onto the screen, any pixels at all as part of your blit, then it, it clears the BLT0 flag. If you perform a blit and it doesn't write any pixels, then it sets that flag. So the question is, when would you actually perform a blit where it's not actually blitting any pixels to the screen or you're not copying any data? Well, this is your example. So what I have is, um, or what I'm going to have anyway, this is a planned system. That's only half of them listed right now. I have a version of the character sprite that is just a one, you know, one bit per pixel sort of version of the sprite that kind of looks like, um, I don't know, like a weird Atari 2600 character <laughs> or something. Um, that only, so it doesn't include the hair, it doesn't include some of the dress, and it doesn't include that black outline around it. So it's, it's really more honestly like what, what your character actually is. So I have this in memory as just like a one bit per pixel version of the character. So then every frame I can look at where the character is on screen, do an intersection blit between that part of the screen, let's say there's a bullet there, like right here. I take this one bit per pixel character, intersect it with that part of the screen, and check the output. So in this example, the output is just this little cluster of pixels here. Um, and I don't even have to write these to a destination. We're not often using the blitter where you're not actually, uh, where you turn off the destination register, but this is an example where you, uh, where you would do that. Um, because again, if no pixels exist in the intersection, it sets this bit. And we do get pixels and it clears the bit, so there's your collision detection. It's not literally free, but this is a tiny little blit. The character's maybe like 12 pixels tall, so that only takes a few cycles to perform collision detection on a screen, again, that is just blanketed full of maybe 200 bullets. Uh, so that's, that's my solution for lenient collision detection in a game like this. Okay, and now I'll just talk a little bit about the release plans. We're, we're reaching the end here, and uh, I can get a drink of water. <laughs> uh, uh, we could have gotten you okay. one. <laughs> This is going to be an NTSC release. This is not how this is an NTSC game, and I can. <laughs> this is the one problem. You can see this. This is a we're in, we're in, This is America. <laughs> uh oh. Uh oh. <laughs> how many people are live on the channel? <laughs> so, no, but I will. I have some good reasons, and I'm going to go through them and then maybe you'll put your pitchforks down. Uh, <laughs> the first thing is, again, 99.9% .9 of the audience is going to be on Steam, uh, or playing it on an emulator, maybe. That's, that's just where my audience is. That's where everyone's going to play the game. Um, so it's not only smoother frame rate, because you get 60 hertz instead of 50, but especially for video recording and streaming, which is obviously really big and important for gaming nowadays, um, Everyone is streaming and recording at 60 <coughs> frames per second, so I don't want to have to deal with like this game full of intense, fast-paced action to be dropping frames in the live stream because it's running at 50 hertz and then the, the stream is at 60. Um, and same with YouTube, YouTube videos, of course. So that's actually like a really important consideration, I think, in releasing this game in order to give everyone the best possible uh, viewing and, in some cases, playing experience. Here's another thing, 320 by 200 is 16 by 10, which is a very well supported resolution, very close to 16 by 9. And I mean, you might be thinking, well, it's 4 by 3, right? It's not actually square pixels, because you take that and you stretch it to a 4 by 3. Well, guess what? We're also using square pixels in this release. So I'm committing two sins. We're doing NTSC uh -huh. and we're doing square pixels. Uh -huh. So if you, if you want to play this on, <laughs> on, uh, on real hardware, then 
you, well, you have the benefit of CRTs with adjustable displays. You can actually squish the screen and stretch it to the, to the correct uh, aspect ratio. But again, if you're playing an emulator, you're playing on Steam, the expectation nowadays with indie games is to have crisp and clear square pixels. So there is no way that I'm going to you know, use some kind of blurry filtering to stretch the pixels on these platforms. Uh, so this just seems like the obvious way to do it. You have a nice aspect ratio, you have crisp square pixels for people playing on Steam, and then again on the old hardware, you can stretch the screen accordingly if I just put you know, in the menus like a like a graphic, like a circle or something that you can use to get the aspect ratio correct, I think that'll that'll definitely be good enough. And also PAL will still work, you know? Um, I think, you know, if I'm gonna be honest, I think you're gonna need a bit of a slower gameplay experience if you want any luck with this game, <laughs> looking at this audience. So so playing it at 50 hertz instead of 60 might actually work in your favor. <laughs> <laughs> what do you say? <laughs> what what are you saying over there? So maybe, maybe I'm misjudging you. Maybe, uh, maybe when I set up the game later over there and you give it a shot, you'll actually crush it and, and, and impress me. But. <laughs> oh, 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 oh. Them's words. <laughs> Them's some words. That's a challenge for a lot of these so. guys now. <laughs> okay. You just need to add up in there. Yeah. Them some words. <laughs> and it's probably going to release sometime in 2025. The game, like the game engine, is looking pretty good at this point. I mentioned I have to develop all the final game assets, all of the levels, all of the narrative, the music, and the artwork. There's, there's still a lot left to do on the game design side. So I'm thinking 2025 is going to be a, a reasonable target for this release. Um, okay, quick sneak peek of the characters, because, because why not? Um, this is a. Uh, this is our main character. Um, we're going for very simple color palette. This whole thing is like maybe five colors at most. You have the blue, you have the skin tone, the white of the socks, the off-white of her hair, and then the black outline. I think that's pretty much it. And it's not only very stylistic, uh, artistically, to have this simple color palette and kind of these dark, uh, sort of cel-shaded shadows. It's kind of very edgy looking with the simple shapes. But of course, the uh, it translates really well to having these little sprites, uh, the character sprites on Amiga, uh, where you only have a few colors to work with. During the gameplay anyway, um, the characters maybe get six or seven colors. Uh, the portraits <laughs> in the dialogue is, and I didn't really talk about that, but the dialogue box is just its own completely separate um, five-bit planes, and so I get a full color palette for the characters in the dialogue box, but this translates really well to the actual game. Uh, this is Watanabe, that's the character from the demo. Um, so we kind of finished her design. She uh, she really loves rumors and gossip, and is kind of evil and just likes causing drama by spreading them. But she talks about them like being delicious and tasty and like and, and that sort of thing. So we wanted to lean into that a little bit. So we gave her this um, sort of floating custard hat and wanted to design her dress to sort of look like a, a box of like a wrapped box of sweets. Um, we want to we want to give like an interesting standout detail to each of these characters to make them a little bit more memorable. So in this case, it is you know uh, the uh, the custard hat is pretty hard to forget. Uh, this is Liliana. It's the librarian that I was talking about. Um, she's kind of like an overworked shut-in who doesn't want to deal with people. So she has like a little bit of the professionalism going on with um, you know she has the tie and she has sort of the uh, the uh, the slit in the bottom of her dress but we wanted to give her the witch hat because it's kind of droopy and makes her look a little bit more tired, you know? So it's, so it's sort of this interesting intersection between professionalism and just like being overworked and, uh, and, and unkempt, I think is the word I'm looking for. Um, and then we have this interesting loop in her hair that's kind of like an inkwell. So it's just like a, it's just a loop, like a big ring, but then when she uses her power, it would fill it with ink and then she would, you know, dip her pen in it and use her pen. So that's kind of her standout feature is the inkwell in her hair. Um, and this is her assistant, Shizu, who is new to the job. So she's kind of the exact opposite, extremely gung-ho and energetic and excited to help out. And uh, for some reason, is Liliana's number one fangirl, despite them having opposite personalities. Um, so we have this very cute dynamic going on that's going to create a fantastic narrative experience as you work your way through this level. You know, you meet Shizu, who's 
talking about how great Liliana is and how she can't wait for you to meet her, and then you meet Liliana and she's like tired and angry and tells you to go away. Uh, I think it'll be a, a very fun narrative to play through. And that's it. So thanks for sticking all the way through. Um, again, if you want to learn more, you can, uh, you know, I, I have some posts on my blog. You can find me on social media. I'll try to keep posting updates about this game. Um, it was really great being here, being able to share all of this. I never get to talk about this stuff, so it's great getting it all out. <laughs>
So I'll let the people on the stream go, and we can um, we can talk lunch. Bye, guys.